Welcome to part 3 of uh, the lecture on instruction scheduling. Uh, very briefly reordering of instructions so as to keep the pipelines full and make sure that there are no stalls is exactly what uh, instruction scheduling is all about. So, as usual it is an NP complete problem and we need lots of heuristics to make it happen very well. The uh, metric which is used to measure the effectiveness of uh, a scheduling algorithm is uh, the length of the schedule. We may need to make sure that it requires the minimum number of cycles. So, the effectiveness of the heuristic is measured based on this. Uh, well, if we apply it on basic blocks it is called local scheduling and uh, if we apply it on many basic blocks then it is called global scheduling and global scheduling can be applied to uh, you know elongated basic blocks called super blocks or hyper blocks. So, we will be looking at some of these techniques today. So, before that, so we looked at uh, you know list scheduling algorithm uh, based on uh, you know a heuristic called longest path and uh, also on slack etcetera. We looked at uh, you know an automaton based scheduling mechanism as well. So, let us first look at uh, uh, what exactly is an optimal scheduling algorithm which is based on integer linear programming. So, the ILP based algorithm has uh, too much overhead in general. So, if it is not implemented very carefully it is not very useful at all, but even with that limitation it is definitely useful for the evaluation of uh, instruction scheduling heuristics because heuristics do not generate optimal schedules. So, we will know how far we are from the optimal. If we generate an optimal schedule using an ILP method then we can measure the effectiveness of the heuristic, but uh, with careful implementation nowadays these methodologies can even be deployed in production quality compilers it seems possible because uh, ILP solution algorithms themselves are becoming more and more uh, uh, you know effective. So, let us assume a simple resource model in which the uh, you know all the functional units are fully pipelined. So, there are no other mechanisms assume an architecture with uh, integer ALU floating point add unit floating point multiply divide unit and a load store unit with possibly differing execution latencies. So, a very general model assume that there are r r instances of the functional unit r ok. So, now to formulate the problem. So, we are we will have to uh, give a, an objective function and also certain set of constraints. So, let sigma i be the time at which uh, the instruction i is scheduled and then let uh, d i j be the weight of the edge i j of the directed acyclic graph representation of the basic block. So, by the way this is also a basic block uh, scheduling algorithm. So, in order to ensure that dependence constraints are satisfied for each arc there is this well known uh, inequality sigma j greater than or equal to sigma i plus d i j this is uh, as usual you know as it was before in the other al other algorithms. Now, you can actually uh, write down the whole thing as a matrix equation. So, what are the matrices? A matrix K which is n cross t where n is the number of instructions in the DAG and t is uh, an estimate of the worst case execution time of the schedule is used. So, what is t and uh, t is the worst case execution time uh, and uh, how do you estimate it? Well, you just take all the instructions some of their uh, execution times and that gives you the W set. Why is this the worst case execution time? Well, you know uh, usually it so happens that uh, instructions would be cached. So, access from memory etcetera would be uh, you know even though it is takes longer with cache it becomes uh, much lesser. So, if you assume that worst case every access um, is made to the memory then you know the sequence of instructions uh, the timings of the sequence of instructions really gives you the W set. So, now what is an element of this matrix K? K i t is 1 
if instruction i is scheduled at uh, time step t and uh, 0 otherwise. So, how do you express uh, this as a matrix equation? It is here, but uh, before that uh, some simple properties. The scheduling time of uh, you know, sigma i of an instruction i can be expressed as uh, sigma i equal to this uh, matrix element k i 0 dot 0, k i 1 dot 1, k i 2 dot 2 etcetera, k i t minus 1 into t, I t minus 1. So, now the point is uh, one of these k i j s is 1, not more than that is 1, because uh, a particular instruction can be scheduled only in one of the time slot 0 to t minus 1. So, wherever it is scheduled that particular k i j will be 1. So, now you have the matrix equation sigma 0, sigma 1 etcetera, sigma n minus 1, these are the scheduling times of the various uh, n instructions. Then these are the matrix elements k 0, k 0, 0, k 0 1 etcetera as listed here, they are either you know 0 or uh, 1 okay. and then we have the time slots uh, 0, 1, 2 etcetera up to t minus 1. So, you can see that each one of these uh, you know once you multiply out, you will get exactly one equation for each one of these lines. Right. So, now what are the other constraints? The first constraint was here sigma j greater than or equal to sigma i plus d i j. Now, what are the other constraints? So, we need to actually put this constraint. Okay. So, to express that each instruction is scheduled exactly once. So, that is this. Okay. So, that is this constraint. So, we actually sum up the uh, coefficients uh, in one row okay. sigma k i t over t. So, each of these you know uh, elements is summed up that should give us a 1 for every one of these uh, rows. So, I take k 0 0 plus k 0 1 etcetera etcetera exactly one of them must be 1. So, their sum must be 1. So, that must happen for every row. So, that is the first uh, restriction which is written here and taken care of formally in this equation. What about the resource constraint? Well, now you are going to look at the columns. So, no more than r r instructions are scheduled uh, in any time step. So, this can be expressed as again take the sum over the column k i t sigma over uh, r t and all r. So, you are summing up uh, you know uh, over i. So, i in uh, f of r, what is f of r? f of r is the set of instructions get that can be executed in functional unit type r. So, if you look at this column, so each of these columns. So, you consider only those uh, instructions you know uh, those uh, elements which correspond to instructions uh, which can be executed on uh, the uh, functional unit r okay. and uh, with this equation must be less, less, this sigma k i t less than or equal to r must be satisfied r r must be satisfied for all t and for all r. So, you sum it up for each type of r you take only those coefficients and sum it up that must be less than or equal to that capital r r. So, that is what this really is. So, uh, groups of these will sum up to that uh, capital R. So, obviously, if that is less than capital R R, then uh, you know the resource constraint is automatically satisfied. So, that takes care of the resource constraint part fairly straightforward to set it up. Now, the objective function is to minimize the execution time or schedule length that is the number of cycles subject to the constraints which we have in equations 1 to 4 above. So, minimize the max of sigma i plus d i j over i. So, this is the simple uh, objective function. So, we have the constraints uh, with sigma i and d i j in the equations 1 to 4. So, solving this using an ILP solver will give us the sigma 0 to sigma n minus 1. So, that is how uh, it would be. So, this is the formulation of the integer linear programming version of uh, scheduling, but as I said it may be quite slow for uh, practical usage. Now, let us consider a restricted method of uh, scheduling called delayed load scheduling algorithm and this works only for trees, but uh, what is really interesting about this particular algorithm is that it generates optimal code without any interlocks for expression trees. There are a reasonable number of uh, restrictions on the architecture. 
first of all you need to have risk load store architecture with uh, delayed loads. In other words, the you can issue um, loads uh, every cycle, but uh, a load will take uh, a little more than you know maybe one cycle or two cycles uh, to uh, produce the result. So, single cycle issue and execution with only loads pipeline load delay equal to one cycle that is the assumption. Optimality will be lost if the load delay is more than one cycle it becomes a heuristic in that case. So, there are three phases in this algorithm. So, in other words uh, we must have single issue instruction single uh, uh, cycle execution and issue for every instruction and for only loads you would have uh, you know one extra cycle uh, for the load to get completed. So, if this is the architecture then the algorithm that we are going to study will certainly give us uh, optimal uh, schedules. There are three phases and this algorithm is based on the well known Sethi Ullman optimal code generation algorithm which is again meant for trees. So, the first phase uh, is computation of the min reg which is the minimum number of uh, registers required to compute a, an expression tree. So, this computation is done as in the Sethi Ullman code generation algorithm. So, we are going to look at that briefly just for uh, recapitulation. Then Sethi Ullman algorithm also gives us an order in which the code should be emitted. So, we are going to use the same order for loads and operations as in the as in the Sethi Ullman algorithm and then emit the code in canonical DLS order. So, the loads and uh, operations will be in the same order, but only thing is uh, some reordering will be done here. So, loads will not be reordered, operations will not be reordered uh, when you consider them on their own, but they may be mixed in some sequence to produce uh, canonical uh, what is known as a DLS delayed load scheduling uh, order. But there is always a catch this sounds too good to be true. So, what is required is it uses one extra register compared to Sethi Ullman algorithm. So, 1 plus min reg number of registers uh, are required and it can handle only one cycle uh, load delay if it is more than one as I said it would be uh, a heuristic not an optimal algorithm. So, this is the Sethi Ullman min reg computation algorithm. So, if uh, the node is a leaf is leaf node then the min reg of that node is just 1. If the node dot left dot min reg is equal to node dot right dot min reg. So, in other words uh, the left and right children subtrees have uh, the same min reg value then as usual node dot min reg is the node dot left dot min reg plus 1. So, you take uh, whatever is the value of the children plus 1. Then you have uh, other case. So, they are unequal. So, then you take the max node dot min reg is max of uh, node dot left dot min reg comma node dot right dot min reg. So, this is the usual uh, Sethi Ullman min reg computation algorithm. So, here is a simple example. So, you have a tree. So, each of the leaves gets uh, 1 then you know this is 1, this is 1. So, this becomes 2, this also becomes 2 and this is 2 and this is 1. So, this is a becomes the max of these 2 that is 2, this is 2 and this is 2. So, this becomes 3 and this becomes uh, 3 max of just this becomes uh, 3. So, 3 registers are required for the computation of this particular tree and here is the 3 address code corresponding to it. So, in the same you know there are loads uh, for intermediate nodes there are uh, you know um, stores and so on and so forth. So, here is uh, so this is I 1 load and uh, T 1 gets a load T 2 gets another load T 3 becomes T 1 plus T 2 etcetera etcetera right. Every intermediate node we are going to store the uh, value. So, how do we translate this to actual machine code? So, if you use 4 registers and uh, do a very simple uh, you know code generation you can still manage to get code. So, simply give one register to each one of these uh, temporaries with uh, judicious reuse of uh, 
these registers. So, R 1 gets slowed, you know R 2 gets slowed. So, for example, here R 1 and R 2 and then this adds and releases one of the registers. right? So, now R 2 is released. So, R 2 gets uh, another load, R 3 gets another load, R 4 gets a fourth one and then R 3 adds, R 2 adds, R 1 adds and uh, D stores. So, this is a fairly simpleton uh, mechanism, simple mechanism which uh, gives you uh, inefficient code. But suppose you want to generate uh, you know optimal code with uh, 3 registers, we are using 4 registers here. So, it is possible this is the usual Satya Ullman uh, sequence. So, we are not going to discuss this in uh, great detail, but uh, it suffices to say if you load R 1 and R 2 and then the left uh, uh, child always uh, uses its result available in the register. Uh, for the uh, result as well. so for the left child's uh, register is always used for the result as well. So, R 1 plus R 2 this is R 1 then R 2 gets a load R 1 equal to R 1 minus R 2 R 2 gets a load R 3 gets a load etcetera etcetera. So, this is the optimal sequence that we generate using the so, so we go to this side and then generate code and then come here generate code finally this and then this. What is the problem with this optimal sequence? It uses minimum number of uh, instru you know registers, but uh, there are stalls. So, if you look at this R 1 and R 2 are being loaded, then R 1 plus R 2 uses both R 1 and R 2, but R 2 requires one extra cycle in order to uh, let the load be completed. So, there is a stall here R 1 is not yet complete. So, one cycle stall is here. Then R 2 gets a load and then uh, R 1 minus R 2 requires uh, usage of R 2. There is another stall here because the load is not yet complete. Finally, there is another load here which and R 3 is used immediately. So, this creates one more stall the load is not yet complete. So, there are three stalls here. So, in other words uh, this sequence you know even though it is uh, 10 long it really becomes 13 cycles. Whereas, with uh, DLS sequence how to get it we will see very soon. Uh, you really require 4 registers, but uh, there will be no stalls. So, the loads are all R 1 is a load R 2 gets another load R 3 gets third load R 4 gets the fourth load then you start adding another load add 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 and store. The basic idea is you actually use up as many registers as are available well, that is 1 plus min right to perform the loads. Okay. So, that is what we have done here R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4 are all uh, getting loads from the main memory. Then every time you perform an operation such as R 1 equal to R 1 plus R 2, you actually release one register. right? So, risk architecture. So, you are using two registers. So, and when you do perform an operation uh, you uh, with using ALU you release one of the registers. So, immediately if there are any more loads you actually start a load operation using that particular register. So, in other words after all the registers have been used for loads now you start a sequence of uh, op and load pairs. So, here is an op and then you have another load this goes on until all the loads are again exhausted finally, the remaining sequence of ops are completed. So, this is the basic idea. So, let us see how it works procedure generate. So, you label the root using the minreg uh, computation method. Now, you also uh, you know get a queue called uh, op shed for operations load shed called uh, for loads and both are initialized to empty list. Now, call the procedure order with the root and then op shed and load shed. So, we will see the details of this and then uh, this uh, you know you find the load and operation order using this and finally, schedule using op shed load shed and uh, root dot min reg plus 1 that is total number of uh, registers minimum number of registers plus 1. So, this emits the actual code. So, what is this procedure order? So, it takes the to begin with it takes the entire tree now it starts uh, you know from the top 
So, uh, then it checks whether it is a leaf. So, if it is a single node obviously, it would be a leaf. So, if it is not a leaf, now it is an internal node. So, I check whether the min reg of left child is less than the min reg of right child. If so, I must emit code for the right child because it requires more number of registers. So, order root dot right, op shed and load shed. So, once the right part is over, you order the left part op shed and load shed. So, now you have completed this is the order in which this ATU Ullman algorithm would emit code. So, if uh, left dot min reg is uh, greater than or equal to root uh, right dot min reg, then it is the other way order root dot left op shed load shed finally, followed by order root dot right op shed load shed. So, if it is a leaf then the uh, root itself is appended to op shed you have completed the children now it is the turn of the root and if it was a leaf you append it to the load shed because uh, leaves are nothing but uh, load operations. Now, the uh, procedure schedule is interesting but it is fairly straightforward. So, for i equal to 1 to min number of uh, regs comma length of load set whatever is uh, minimum let us say you have more registers uh, and uh, sorry you have less registers and uh, more uh, loads. So, you first schedule all the loads. Okay. So, load equal to pop head load set you get a load operation give it a register load dot reg equal to get reg then generate a load instruction load comma uh, gen load comma load dot name comma load dot right. This is performed in a cycle. So, you should all the loads you have more loads than number of registers. So, you have exhausted the number of registers. Now, start performing operation load pairs. Okay. So, take uh, an operation from the op shed give it a register which is nothing but op dot left dot right and then uh, generate op dot op, op dot left dot reg, op dot right dot reg and op dot reg. So, source des and destination are all mentioned here. Then immediately after the operation you perform a load. So, load equal to again get a load operation, give it a register and generate the load instruction. So, you have performed uh, all the loads first, then op load uh, pairs and finally, uh, emit all the operations which are remaining. So, okay, get an operation, give it a register and generate the op instruction, uh, generate the operation re free re write register. So, this sequence uh, you know as I showed you here all the loads then um, op load pairs as many as necessary and finally, all the ops. So, can is uh, can be proved to generate uh, optimal sequence of instructions. So, this proof is available uh, in literature, but we will not spend time on this. So, the main advantage of this particular scheme is that it generates optimal code for trees, but uh, once the it is not a tree the, this algorithm cannot be used and if the delay of the load instruction is more than one then it becomes a heuristic it can still be used, but it becomes a heuristic. Now, so let us move on to what is known as uh, global acyclic uh, scheduling. So, here uh, so far we have seen uh, you know uh, scheduling within a basic block. So, now let us look outside the basic block. So, average size of a basic block is uh, quite small. So, it is uh, 5 to 20 instructions. So, effectiveness of uh, instruction scheduling is uh, very limited. So, what see the problem is uh, if you have very small basic blocks 5 to 20 instructions. Then uh, you know every time you start the execution of that basic block you actually end up uh, executing a branch which flushes all the pipelines. So, these branch instructions create serious problems as far as uh, pipelines are concerned. So, uh, the effectiveness of instruction scheduling is very limited if the size of basic blocks is uh, very small. So, this is a very serious concern in architecture supporting uh, great amount of uh, parallelism instruction level parallelism. Say for example, VLIW architecture with uh, several function units and super scalar architectures with uh, multiple instruction issue facilities. So, in VLIW you have many function units 
So, if the basic blocks are very small at the end of the basic block anyway there is a jump. So, you have to flush everything all the pipelines you cannot even use all the pipelines. So, by the time you start using one or two the end of the basic block is inside. So, most of the other uh, resources will be unutilized and in superscalar architectures you can issue many instructions in uh, one cycle. So, again you know by the time you start issuing instructions the end of the basic block is inside. So, the facility of multiple issue is not used effectively. Now, what is global scheduling? This is meant for a set of basic blocks. Obviously, you can uh, one possibility to make the basic block much larger than uh, what it is in the normal case is to unroll the loop. Right? So, if you unroll the loop as we have seen in the case of uh, parallelization, the number of iterations will reduce, but uh, the basic block the body of the loop increases in size. So, in such a case it is possible to use uh, you know scheduling uh, um, basic block scheduling and still do very well, but you may not be able to do this uh, uh, you know uh, unrolling uh, very effectively every time, because there will still be some if then else and other instructions inside. So, if there is a control flow graph inside uh, a loop and not just one basic block you are still back to square one. So, we need to look at methods which can um, put basic several basic blocks together and still achieve a, uh, a, a good schedule or give us produce a good schedule. So, it overlaps execution of successive basic blocks trace scheduling, super block scheduling, hyper block scheduling, software pipelining etcetera are mechanisms for doing this. So, we are going to look at uh, trace scheduling, super block scheduling and hyper block scheduling. Software pipelining will be the topic for uh, another lecture. So, what is trace scheduling? So, a trace is a frequently executed cy acyclic sequence of uh, basic blocks in a control flow graph. So, for example, if you look at this uh, program the assembly code and uh, control flow graph. So, this is a for loop it has uh, an if then else inside and then a sum instruction. So, this is the basic block structure uh, the control flow graph of this with uh, the instructions being mentioned in the various blocks inside here. So, uh, in this case uh, you know suppose uh, we want to identify a trace. Okay. So, we are going to look at uh, the most frequently executed sequence of uh, blocks for example, if b 1, b 2, b 4 this path is executed very frequently, but uh, b 1, b 3, b 4 is not executed very frequently. So, we would call this b 1, b 2, b 4 as uh, a trace. Okay identify the most frequently executed uh, basic block. So, this is the method for uh, identifying a trace itself extend the trace starting from this block forward and backward along most frequently executed paths. So, there is no hard and fast rule when to end. So, let us say this is the most frequently executed path. So, we can grow in this direction and this direction keep going until uh, the uh, reasonably large basic block set is uh, obtained and uh, we are always going in the direction of uh, hot basic blocks and not cold basic blocks. So, there is no a strict definition of a trace it is just a group of uh, hot basic blocks uh, along a single path. Okay. Now, we can continue, uh, you know, consider uh, each of these traces as uh, extended basic blocks and uh, apply the list scheduling strategy on the trace itself okay including the branch instruction of course we are going to move the, uh, how to um, take care of the effect of branch instructions we will see that a little later there may be some code compensation which is necessary so for example we are going to treat b1 b2 b4 as a single basic block move instructions uh, they are subject to dependencies within these basic blocks and uh, schedule them and as I said uh, we are going to move the branch instructions also and that may introduce uh, you know uh, some necessity to uh, compensate introduce compensation code we will see that a little later. 
So, execution time for the trays may reduce because now the basic blocks have grown in size. So, this is one huge block. So, we will have probably much better uh, um, parallelism available and uh, schedule may be much better, but then uh, this part which is not very frequently executed uh, will suffer in this process. So, execution time for the trace main trace may reduce, but execution time for the other parts may increase as well. We will see example of this. However, because the main trace executed executes uh, a large number of times and the other parts do not execute too many times, overall performance will definitely improve. So, let us go through this example. There are four basic blocks. So, each basic block has a couple of uh, instructions and each one of them has uh, you know this has a branch instruction, this has a branch instruction, this has a branch instruction and so on and so forth. Now, suppose you take each basic block and uh, schedule them using the basic block scheduling technique, then we get this uh, basic block schedule. So, we are assuming a two way issue architecture with two integer units we are assuming that add sub and store require one cycle each, load requires two cycles, go to requires no stall at all and uh, 9 cycles for the uh, then this is the schedule that we produce. So, what we do is uh, we take each one of these uh, basic blocks uh, reorder instructions and see how we where we stand. So, because of this load there is a cycle of uh, no up here and again because of this load there is a no up here because of uh, this load you know there is another uh, this thing here and so on and so forth. Okay. So, no, no there is nothing here okay. so, it is just a blank. So, here for example, uh, uh, the number of cycles for the main trace, what is this main trace? The main trace is B 1, B 2, B 4 and the off trace is B 1, B 3, B 4. So, if you take consider the main trace then uh, you know this is B 1, this is B 2 and this is B 4 right and then uh, off trace would be then B 1 and then you go to I 7. So, this and this. Okay. So, this is the sequence and uh, the amount of time that you require is 9 cycles for the main trace. So, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 then uh, 7, 8 all right. So, th this uh, go to is executed here go to I 9 that is uh, it is here. So, you require 9 cycles for the main trace and where is the off trace? So, 0, 1, 2, 3 cycles then you go to I 7 straight away. So, this is uh, 4 then uh, you come here and execute this as well 4 and 5. Okay. So, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is uh, 6 cycles. So, this is the reference let us see how we improve or otherwise uh, from this point onwards. So, what the let us apply trace scheduling on this. Now, we need to combine uh, uh, basic blocks and uh, uh, move instructions from one to another. We did not move any instructions from B 1 to B 2 or B 2 to B 3 or B 3 to B 2 etcetera etcetera. We did not do any of this. We stuck to the basic block structure and scheduled instructions within the basic block here. In trace scheduling we are going to do that. So, for example, these two instructions will be combined here and scheduled. This particular instruction will be combined with these and scheduled and the branch will go away. So, that is our main uh, uh, you know trace and this is the off trace. So, how does that uh, aff get affected? So, you have uh, because of uh, you know movement of instructions uh, being possible from one basic block to the other. So, we have only two traces rather than um, four basic blocks main trace and off trace. So, uh, we start here we have uh, scheduled instructions for the main trace. So, we require 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, suppose uh, at this point you had said I 2 uh, R 2 not equal to 0 go to I 7. So, we executed uh, 0, 1, 2 went to I 7 executed this and then went back to I 9 executed this and came out. So, in other words uh, because this is the off trace the main trace will execute like this this is executed one cycle of uh, latency because of the load 
then you execute this uh, r 2 e is equal to 0. So, we go just fall through execute this execute this execute this and of course, all these instructions are also executed in the parallel units and then uh, go back to i 1. So, this is your main trace it keeps going. So, 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 cycles for it whereas, uh, for the off trace you execute this latency here then r 2 is not equal to 0. So, you come to i 7. So, 0 1 2 3 cycles 4 then 5 cycles go over to i 9 again 6 and 7 cycles ok i this i 9 and i 11. So, you have required uh, you really 7 cycles for the off trace and 6 cycles for the main whereas, in the previous case we required 9 cycles for the main it now it has been reduced to 6 we required 6 cycles for the off trace, but now we require 7. So, we have increased the time for uh, the off trace, but reduce the time for the main trace since the main trace executes more often than the off trace uh, we still improve the performance of the program. Now, there are uh, actually side exits and uh, side entrances which are ignored during the scheduling of a trace what does it mean. So, for example, here right. So, we this is a side exit if r 2 not equal to 0 go to i 7. So, we come here and then uh, go to i 9 we come here. So, this is a side entrance right. So, we did not worry about uh, the side exit and side entrance when we scheduled the traces we just moved the code appropriately based on dependencies and thought that everything will be ok, but obviously things are not all right required compensation code is inserted during the bookkeeping that is after the scheduling of the trace. So, why does uh, why do we need to introduce code compensation we will see that compensation code we will see that very soon, but whatever is needed will have to be introduced after the scheduling is uh, over. Now, speculative code motion that is uh, load instruction mode ahead of uh, conditional branch creates some problem. For example, register R 3 should not be live in block R B 3 in the off trace. So, let me show you the block again. So, for example, here. So, this I 3 which is uh, loading the register R 3 with uh, B R 1 will be moved here let us say right it is scheduled along with this. So, R 3 was here. So, it did not actually it was not live when the basic block be uh, this basic block was executed it would have come like this, but if you had gone like this R 3 would not have uh, been live at all, but once R 3 is uh, this instruction is moved here R 3 is being loaded with the value. So, R 3 is actually live at the entry of this particular basic block now this is a side effect. So, if this happens there may be actually some difficulty. So, there may be unwanted exceptions caused and uh, you know uh, let us say some load uh, R 3 uh, load became illegal along the off trace it was legal along the main trace, but along the off trace it became uh, illegal or something like that. Then uh, there may be uh, some unwanted exceptions and uh, to trace these and uh, you know take care of it requires additional hardware support. So, in other words uh, trace scheduling cannot be done without uh, some hardware support. So, now let us look at the issue of compensation code when it is needed and what. Here is a sequence of uh, 5 instructions and uh, we know that it can be reordered ok. These instructions can be reordered we reorder them and produce another instruction sequence here. So, 1 2 3 4 5 became 2 3 4 1 5 in other words 2 3 4 5 remain and 1 was inserted in between. When we were executing this code we would have executed 1 2 3 4 5 and gone ahead or we would have executed 1 2 and then left through the exit, but when we reordered the code 1 came here. So, we execute 2 and then possibly leave or execute 2 3 4 1 5 and then continue this is incorrect. We have not executed uh, instruction 1 at all when we were trying to take the exit. So, 
we need to introduce some compensation code to make sure that instruction 1 is also executed after instruction 2 just before leaving. So, when do where do we insert that compensation code obviously, here. So, like this. So, when we reorder this instruction 2 this is the exit we introduce instruction 1 here and then go ahead. Why is this legal? It is legal because uh, the ordering permits instruction 2 to be executed before instruction 1 otherwise even the main trace would have been illegal. right? So, it is legal. So, we are executing 2 and then 1 in the main trace. So, we introduce the compensation code instruction 1 in the exit path. So, uh, uh, when we exit uh, after ins executing instruction 2 we execute instruction 1 and then leave. So, now the problem is uh, we have inserted, inserted 2 copies of instruction 1. So, there is uh, some code which is uh, increasing in size. Then again the same sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, this was executed either in this way or if we entered through the side entry we would have executed 3, 4, 5. If we reorder this uh, main trace okay, it became 1, 5, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 5 remained as it is, 1 remained as it is, 5 was inserted in between. Now, the main trace is ok, dependencies have uh, taken care of the uh, ordering. So, 1, 5, 2, 3, 4 uh, is a legal order, but when we enter the trace which is reordered we actually get uh, we execute only 3 and 4 we are not executing 5 which is again incorrect. So, what is the compensation code that is necessary we will have to introduce some code here like this. So, you introduce instruction 5 which is legal and then uh, when we enter through this you execute 5, 3 and 4 this order is ok because anyway the order was 1, 5, 2, 3, 4. So, 5, 3, 4 is a perfectly legal order. So, again we have introduced instruction 5 in 2 places and there is some code uh, which is increasing in size. So, this is how compensation code is uh, introduced. So, it uh, actually increases the size of the code, but uh, in order to make sure that the exits and entrances are covered properly and there is no change in the semantics of the program, we will have to introduce this compensation code. So, what we saw was uh, trace scheduling of a general kind and uh, there are specializations of this called uh, super block and hyper block scheduling. So, what exactly is uh, super block scheduling? So, a super block is a trace without side entrances. So, but then uh, how do you get rid of these side entrances? Well, you are really going to uh, you know do some code duplication. Control can enter only from the top, many exits are possible and it eliminates several bookkeeping overheads. But how do you perform super blocks? Trace formation as before, tail duplication in order to avoid side entrances into a super blocks and this implies increase in code size. Code compensation itself was incre you know the uh, was increasing the code size. So, we thought uh, we will not have side entrances, but then uh, in order to take care of that we anyway have to do some code duplication. Here is an example. The same previous block you know we had 4 uh, basic blocks uniting here. So, this tail block has been repeated. So, the main trace so, we had our main trace uh, like this right. So, this was our main trace and this was the off trace. So, we have duplicated this this particular code. So, this is our main trace and this is our off trace now. Okay. So, the, uh, there are no um, the side entrances at all there is only there are multiple side exits possible. Okay. So, there is no side entrance otherwise we would have had a side entrance at this point. Okay. This would have been the main trace and this is the off trace, off trace would have introduced in uh, entered the main trace. So, now there is nothing of that kind, but this obviously increases the code size. So, now we take each one of these traces and uh, schedule them appropriately by moving instructions wherever we want. So, if that happens we go uh, if it is a main trace then we get uh, 0 1 2 4 5 right that is uh, 1 0 1 2 3 4 that is 5 cycles for the main trace 
and if it was the off trace, we would have said uh, go to I 7 straight away and execute that. So, 0 1 2 then 3 4 5. Okay. So, 6 cycles for the off trace. So, we have reduced the um, length of the main trace by one more cycle that is now we require only 5 cycles uh, in the super block uh, scheme, but then the core size has increased. Okay. One basic block has been replicated. The next method of uh, scheduling is called hyperblock scheduling. So, superblock scheduling does not work well with uh, control intensive programs. That is, if there are many, uh, you know, control paths, okay, that is many decision boxes, then um, this program, uh, this uh, superblock scheduling will replicate code in too many places and uh, it is this is not acceptable. So, we have to keep some measure of how much code has increased, uh, you know how, how much uh, has increased and uh, then stop actually super block scheduling at that point. So, for control intensive applications hyper block scheduling was introduced. Here the control flow graph is if converted to eliminate conditional branches. So, and uh, if we do if, if conversion then it replaces conditional branches with appropriate predicate uh, predicated instructions. So, that means, we need hardware for uh, predicated uh, instruction execution. Now, control dependence is changed to a data dependence. We have seen if conversion in parallelization. So, let us do some recapitulation here. So, here is a loop with uh, i equal to 1 to 100 if a i less than or equal to 0 then continue otherwise a i equal to b i plus 3. So, if we do if conversion, we uh, compute a predicate p equal to a i less than or equal to 0 that is this predicate and then uh, this instruction is uh, predicated. Okay. So, this should have been uh, uh, not p not uh, you know because if a i less than or equal to 0 then continue. So, we are skipping this instruction. So, this is p. So, this should have been not p not p that means, uh, if the predicate is false, then we execute a i equal to b i plus 3. Okay. So, that is how uh, it would be. Now, if you take another example, here a i equal to d i plus 1 that remains as it is. If b i greater than 0, then c i equal to c i plus a i else d i plus 1 equal to d i plus 1 plus 1. So, if the predicate is true, then execute this instruction. If the predicate is false, execute this instruction. Now, the basic block now contains all these four instructions without any control flow the same is true here as well. So, we have changed uh, control dependence to data dependence. Now, these instructions can be reordered based on data dependence and we do not have to worry about control dependence again. So, this is uh, the uh, uh, original example of basic blocks. Now, suppose we do hyper block formation this is what happens. So, we actually introduce all the four blocks into the same hyper block because we are doing if conversion there is no problem at all. Okay. So, there are no jumps and uh, no pipeline stalls. So, we have uh, uh, you know just one schedule for this entire hyper block. So, 6 cycles are required for the entire set of predicated instructions. So, you can observe predicated instructions here b r 1 equal to r 4 if p 1 and on this side we have uh, b r 1 equal to r 2 if not p 1, r 4 equal to r 2 if not p 1 etcetera, etcetera. The other thing that we need to observe here is instructions i 3 and i 4 can be executed speculatively and they can be moved up instead of being scheduled after cycle 2. So, observe that i 3 and i 4 they would have actually they were here you know. So, uh, an if instruction here would have uh, actually force them to execute after the predicate is uh, executed, but uh, since they are independent of any of these predicates they can be moved up, they can be executed even speculatively there is no harm in uh, executing them uh, speculatively. So, that is why the number of uh, cycles has been reduced to 6. So, if we had to push i 3 and i 4 also after uh, one cycle after cycle 2 we would have required 2 more cycles for the trace to execute. So, in the in general hyperblock scheduling may not give great benefits, it requires uh, predicate uh, instruction execution predicated instruction execution hardware as well. Uh, 
So, it may not be very useful on general purpose uh, machines. Now, there is another uh, small optimization which is possible called uh, delayed branch uh, scheduling. So, what is delayed branching? So, suppose you consider an ordinary branch. Okay. The branch actually the instruction following the branch is uh, executed only if uh, based on the branch condition, it is not executed unconditionally. But in delayed branch scheduling, in order to reduce the minimize the effects of pipeline stalls introduced by branches, one instruction immediately following the delayed branch instruction will be executed before the branch is taken. Okay. So, it would have been executed if the branch is not taken, but even if the branch is taken, this instruction is executed and then the branch is taken. So, that is called a delayed branching, one instruction execution extra. The instruction occupying the delay slot should be obviously independent of the branch instruction. So, in other words, uh, whether the branch goes to the target or the or it falls through, the instruction following it uh, should be executed and or at least should be harmless. Okay. So, what are the conditions uh, for uh, this sort of branch delay slot insertion? It is best to fill the branch delay slot with an instruction from the basic block that the branch terminates. So, let me show you an example. So, here is a basic block, here is the jump instruction jump are not equal to 0 or 3 and here is the delay slot. So, suppose uh, here is an instruction and that uh, you know R 1 and R 2 are not modified in the region from that instruction to the jump, R 4 is not used at all in this region, then that means this instruction can be executed even in the delay slot. So, we can move that here, so that is delayed uh, branch scheduling and uh, that is very useful. So, no side effects and uh, pipelines will not be stalled. Then, Suppose, this is not possible. Now, an instruction from either the target block or the fall through block whichever is most likely to be executed is selected and there are uh, cases here. So, the selected instruction uh, should either be a root node of uh, the DAG of the basic block. So, let us look at another example. So, here is the basic block, here is the jump instruction and here is the delay slot. This is the target block and this is the fall through block. So, in the let us say we have a an instruction uh, in this fall through block. Okay. So, this is the first instruction which is the root node of that particular uh, block this block and uh, this delay slot is filled let us say with that instruction. Now, R 6 gets some value because of the sub instruction and uh, the condition to be satisfied is that uh, R 6 should not be live at the entry to this particular target block. If R 6 is recomputed later in this block, it is ok, but uh, if we say R 6 was live here, it would have created a problem, it would have taken the wrong value. Whatever value was computed here may not be relevant here. So, we cannot insert this instruction here without affecting this target block. Then another condition is and has a destination register that is not live in, in the other block, this I already showed. If this is not true, possibly a destination register that can be renamed. So, this is case 2, case 3 is actually symmetrical. So, the uh, instead of uh, this being the fall through block, let us say this is the target block and this is the fall through block that is what is written here. So, if we move the code from here to here, then this no this register R 6 should not be live in here this point it should not be live at the entry of this particular block. This is just a symmetrical uh, case. And the last case is you have the delay slot here, delay slot, you have the target block and fall through block, you have an instruction here which uses R 3. So, this is also R 3 and this is also R 3. So, there is a slight problem possibly and what we really do is uh, we try to rename this register, It this could be R 3 or this could be something else also just putting R 3 here. Suppose R 3 can be renamed to R 6. Okay. Then the instruction reads as uh, sub R 4, R 5, R 6, but again if the condition that R 6 is not live at the entry of this is satisfied, 
we can rename the register and then move this to this particular slot. So, this way in a few cases it is possible to move an instruction from either the same block or the target block or the uh, fall through block into the relay slot thereby we do not have to put a no op into this particular slot the pipeline stalls are uh, reduced and this may be effective uh, uh, by it, it this may actually give a little more speed up uh, than uh, usual case. So, in general uh, unless we apply all the scheduling techniques and try to speed up programs uh, we may not get uh, very good instruction level parallelism in uh, programs and scheduling may not be that effective. So, this is the end of this lecture in the next uh, lecture we will uh, discuss software pipelining. Thank you. Thank you.